and the objectives today um, identify behaviors associated with dementia, identify the drug classes used to treat these behavioral problems, identify the risks of antipsychotic medications in those with dementia and psychosis, and ways that we try to avoid overuse of antipsychotic medications and other medications. So behavioral disturbances in dementia are extremely common and do occur probably in 90% of those suffering from dementia. Um, 75, I would say at least 75% of nursing home residents will have behavioral issues with half of those having two or more behavioral problems. And these problems occur in all stages of dementia, starting with mild, going through end stage dementia. We have these issues. So, um, why do we care? Well, the behavioral disturbances relate in care, uh, result in caregiver stress and often institutionalization and hospitalization. Um, and often the agitation we see increases as uh, dementia progresses and cognitive abilities decline further over time. Um, and like was mentioned before, when we're looking at these disturbances, we do want to take into account um, premorbid personality issues. Um, the prior speaker said, you know, we want to address the here and now, but when we're being asked to use medications, we don't want to medicate um, an issue that is really more personality um, related. So we have patients who may complain all the time, may not ever go to an activity, but when the families say they've always been this way, they've never engaged in a group activity in their life, we don't want to say, oh, they're depressed, that's not why they're going to give a medication, when it really is more, this is how they've always been, or the person's always been negative. So we don't want to assume this is a result of depression and then give medications that aren't necessarily needed. So when we talk about the behavioral issues, the most common three problems are agitation, depression, and psychosis. And agitation being the most common, um, we'll review. So we have two types, the non-aggressive type and the aggressive type. And non-aggressive agitation can be verbal in nature and uh, examples are constant uh, requests for attention, complaints, and screaming. Um, and these are things that often we will not use medication for, um, but uh, take a more behavioral approach. And physical um, uh, non-aggressive agitation can consist of pacing, disrobing, and getting out of the chair and bed repeatedly. And getting out of the chair and bed repeatedly is a major issue because we're very concerned these patients are going to fall and suffer from injuries such as fractures. Aggressive agitation includes verbal type with threats and name calling. And uh, this, this is a situation that I do approach a lot um, because caregivers, family members can be quite sensitive to this. Patients may make um, racist comments or other types of issues. And we do try to point out um, that the patients aren't always aware of what they're doing and trying to certainly not take these comments personally. Um, and nonverbal aggressive agitation is uh, one of the biggest problems we deal with because staff members or family members can get hurt. Um, so things like biting, hitting, pushing, scratching, resisting care, um, is another aspect of that and often results in these behaviors because the patient uh, does not want care, so they may strike out. Um, other uh, behavioral issues we'll touch on include sleep uh, disturbance and wandering. And we want to recognize that uh, delusions, hallucinations, depression, and sleep disturbance may all underlie the behavioral uh, agitation that we just were discussing. Loneliness uh, is an aspect uh, that we want to be aware of because it can contribute to the patient's agitation. Um, so uh, things that we can do to try to help with the patient's loneliness uh, is have the patient interact with someone they're close with or they have a loving relationship with. Give as much one-on-one -on -one attention as possible. Um, animals uh, coming to visit, massage therapy uh, can all help with loneliness. And then we can have tapes or videos of loved ones, even in the patient's room, to make them feel like they're around loved ones 
for instance, in a nursing home where they may have a visit only once a week or even once a month. Boredom is uh, something that can result in quite a bit of agitation. The patients don't know what to do with themselves. And um, in these situations, more stimulation can help so the patient is more occupied. Uh, examples could be sensory stimulation, such as aromatherapy, music, touch, books that the patient can manipulate, um, buttons and snaps, things that they can just do with their hands to stay busy. Um, and then we can also give uh, patients with dementia meaningful activities, such as folding laundry or cleaning, um, helping cook or mix something, and to give them more of a purpose so they don't feel that their time is useless, which I hear dementia patients complain about quite a bit. They don't know what to do with their time. They don't know what the point of their life is now. Uh, psychosis uh, often consists of delu delusions or hallucinations are the two most common types of psychosis we see in our dementia patients. Um, delusions are fixed false beliefs. Um, and we usually can't sway the patients that uh, these beliefs aren't true. Um, paranoia is a common type of delusion and is most prominent in the middle stages of dementia. Um, commonly, people may think someone is stealing things from their room, breaking in, the food may be poisoned. And in early dementia, we often see delusions that one spouse is cheating on them. That's a very common one. Visual hallucinations can include animals, intruders, seeing complex scenes. Often patients with dementia say they see their mother or father. And often women seem to uh, see children quite a bit. So those are all common visual hallucinations. And uh, we also, of course, have auditory hallucinations, which would consist of patients saying they hear voices that we don't hear or appreciate. Depression is extremely common and occurs in at least half of those who suffer from dementia. And one thing we want to be careful is to differentiate apathy and depression. So apathy, usually, it can look like depression. The patient is typically not motivated. They don't want to engage in activities. But the patient is not subjectively uh, upset or distressed about this. They really don't care. They feel like things are OK for them. And often, that does not respond very well to antidepressants. But with uh, depression, the patient subjectively feels their mood is low, and they are distressed by that condition. And depression often can go unnoticed and may be driving the agitation or behavioral disturbance. But because we're more focused on the difficulty of dealing with the patient or their behaviors, we may not look beneath that and realize depression is uh, underlying their behavioral difficulties. Anxiety uh, can be quite prominent in patients with dementia. Um, often in early stages, the patients are aware, for instance, they're losing their independence, they can't drive, they've lost their home, and all these things can result in a lot of anxiety. And just realizing the fact they um, are, they're losing their faculties is very distressing. Uh, and once again, these, um, the, sorry, the anxiety can lead to the behavioral issues as well. Sundowning is a common uh, issue that I'm called about um, when the patients become more psychotic or agitated as the day progresses. Um, causes of sundowning can uh, be changes in sleep patterns, loneliness. They may not understand that time of the day or have um, good structure throughout the day, so the afternoon, evening may be less structured uh, and may result in these issues. Um, medications typically are not the first line approach. We want to make sure the day is structured. Um, for instance, if the patient is getting enough rest earlier in the day, maybe several quick rest periods so that they're not fatigued at the end of the day. And in the evening, making sure the environment uh, becomes possibly more quiet and calm um, to accommodate getting ready for a nighttime. Disruptive vocalizations is another example of behavioral difficulties we encounter frequently. 
particularly as dementia progresses. Uh, these may be associated with anxiety, depression, physical discomfort, or other environmental factors that are making the patient uncomfortable. What, some uh, things we can try are, for one, is music may help the patient feel stimulated and less isolated and keep them occupied so they're not uh, making uh, so much noise. And we can, if the patient is able to understand, reward positive, uh, quiet behaviors and appropriate help seeking. So if the patient is able to ask for their, or voice their needs appropriately rewarding this, and maybe they'll uh, be able to decrease the repetition to some degree. Uh, sleep disturbance, uh, we don't typically think of uh, as a behavior that the patient's exhibiting, but it's very important because it fuels uh, daytime agitation and behavioral difficulties. Uh, and sleep disturbance is very common in those with dementia. Uh, probably about half of those uh, may exhibit this. And what age alone is a predictor of uh, increased difficulty with sleep. We have decrease in various stages of sleep, such as REM sleep, which is the stage where we dream, and uh, slow, slow wave sleep, which is our deep sleep. So there's a lot more wake, wakefulness during the night. Um, and things that can further exacerbate the sleep difficulties include decrease in daytime activity, not enough exercise, depression, and then the typical problems such as sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome that we need to be aware of that may further uh, uh, cause difficulties with sleep. And some uh, treatments that we can think of before using sleep medications, which we certainly try to avoid in patients with dementia, include light therapy, especially keeping things bright in the morning during the day. Um, melatonin is a uh, medication we can give that is fairly low risk, um, increasing exercise, proper sleep environment. Um, in facilities, there's often a lot of noise during the night, lights on and off, people coming out in and out of the rooms. So definitely, definitely minimizing that, as that would disturb any of our sleep. Um, and then, of course, decreasing caffeine in the evening, alcohol. And sometimes, people may be put to sleep too early. So that can uh, make them more uncomfortable, and they may obsess that they're about not falling asleep. So thinking about what would be the best time for the patient to be put in bed so they're not laying there awake for so long. And um, sleep disturbance in patients with dementia can certainly result in caregiver burnout. I have a lot of people who come in, and that's one of their biggest complaints. Their spouse is up during the night. They're worried they may leave the house or get into trouble in the kitchen, and it's a major safety issue that may result in institutionalization of the patient. Um, sleep disturbance may precipitate or worsen daytime agitation, irritability, and aggressive behavior. And the patient may not be able to exhibit their optimal function um, or cognition due to this fatigue and lack of sleep. Um, and additionally, when someone's fatigued and not well rested, there's a higher risk of fall and traumatic injury. Um, so I'll just mention there was a study where they looked at about 120-some patients, and they did find sleep disturbance to be associated with depression, disinhibition, and aberrant motor behavior, which could include pacing. Um, so let's skip the rest. Okay. Self-injurious behavior is another behavior issue that was touched on in the previous talk. And uh, this uh, a good example is when people are picking at their skin. And like it was mentioned before, patients may have delusions that bugs are crawling on them, which may result in this. And for instance, I have a patient who has a mole on his shoulder, and he truly believes there's something called a mole bug that's living in his mole. And he really can't be swayed from that belief, so he's always picking at it. Um, and Usually, phys a physical barrier is the first approach instead of medications, possibly sleeves, maybe a jumpsuit, something patients can't remove. But when we want to clarify, though, if the behavior is being um, fueled by delusions, because that would be a situation where we would more likely use antipsychotic medications. 
Hoarding um, is a behavior that seems to be more distressing to staff than the patient. Um, often they will um, acquire things such I have, a, I have a patient who collects washcloths and he, the patient grabs every washcloth they can find. Um, and when the patient is hoarding a certain object, they can become agitated if someone tries to remove them. Um, so sometimes we use medication, but other behavioral things we could possibly do is provide an area from which they can acquire these things. Um, and everyone understands, for instance, they're allowed to take these washcloths and eventually, you know, you can try to round them up when the patient isn't there. But, um, you know, if it's not harming anyone, trying to find a way to deal with it without using medications. So sexually inappropriate behaviors is probably one of our biggest problems because it uh, jeopardizes the safety of other people when someone's living in a group uh, situation. And this, uh, these behaviors can be verbal, saying inappropriate things, and they can uh, consist of things such as exposing one's body, grabbing other people, or touching other people. And uh, we would like to use the behavioral approach with these behaviors, but sometimes we do need to use medications because, as I said, when we jeopardize the safety of others, that's definitely uh, calls for more aggressive use of medication. And I've listed some medication classes that we uh, consider uh, when medications are needed. So emergent behavioral disturbances, times when we think of using medications first, include when someone exhibited suicidal behaviors or thoughts, physical assaults on others, profound weight loss secondary to depression, they just won't eat and they're jeopardizing their health, they're refusing medications that are needed, and risk of self-harm. And we can think of the behavioral disturbances as primary and secondary. So primary typically is occurring from the disease that is causing the patient's dementia. And secondary would be other co-occurring uh, issues, such as medical issues or medications that may be resulting in more confusion and behavioral uh, issues. And this is important because, of course, we're trying to minimize medication use, so we always want to consider the secondary causes of the behavioral problems, not necessarily coming from the dementing disorder itself, but what else is going on that we can treat um, before resorting to medication use. And then the next slide just demonstrates we can have a combination of uh, primary and secondary causes. So things that are less likely to respond to medication include wandering, hoarding, apathy, repetitive verbalizations, and situation-specific behaviors. So if someone is always upset the three times a week they have to be bathed. That's not something we're necessarily going to globally medicate for, and uh, it would certainly be better to work with the patient and find the best way to approach bathing than considering medication. Um, so I'm sure there's other situation-specific behaviors. You can think of like changing dressings. Um, so we really need to think about the best way to do that before thinking about medications. And why should we treat these behaviors? Um, we know that they can cause significant distress to both the patient and the caregiver. Uh, behavioral uh, difficulties increase hospitalizations, which are extremely expensive. Institutionalization, um, which many patients are trying to avoid, and they would prefer to stay home at if all possible. And that relates to caregiver burnout. They just can't do it anymore. And the behaviors can also be dangerous and even life-threatening to the patient or others in their environment. So treatment of the behavioral issues, we really have no FDA-approved medication. So everything is off-label. Uh, the strongest evidence we have for treating the behavioral issues in psychosis related to dementia are antipsychotic medications. Um, and then antidepressants, and SSRIs are a type of antidepressant um, that increase serotonin in the brain. Um, and 
as far as anti-epileptic medications like Depakote, Tegretol, Neurontin, the evidence is inconsistent, but we, we do use them and there is uh, some positive evidence that they work. And one thing is most of the studies of medications for the treatment of these issues in dementia are short term, so we don't have a lot of long term evidence. The American Psychiatric Association's recommendation is quite old, but at that time they recommended the use of antipsychotics as there is the most evidence in that class of medication for treating the behavioral issues in psychosis. And then I've listed some other uh, medications that were recommended at the time. So one class of medications we use in treating these uh, behavioral issues are the anti-dementia medications. And the first type are cholinesterase inhibitors, which increase acetylcholine, which is a chemical in the brain. And the ones that we've heard of, these are the generic names, but our Aricept, Exelon, Reminil are the cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, and they may be useful in behavioral issues, particularly in moderate stages of dementia. And again, like all the medications we're going to talk about today, all of them have studies with conflicting results, usually some positive, some negative, that they were not effective when compared to other medications or even placebo. And memantine, which is Nemenda, questionable if it really helps with uh, agitation, but some people will try it. So the cholinesterase inhibitors, for the nurses here, we should recognize the main um, side effects. Um, gastrointestinal side effects are probably the most common, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And then we also, if any of you have the knowledge these patients have peptic ulcer disease, we want to be particularly careful because these medications could worsen that or cause it to reoccur. We always worry about cardiac um, conduction, the energy through the heart with these medications, because it could potentially slow that conduction through the heart, which could increase the risk of abnormal heart rhythm, which is dangerous. Um, and we also need to pay attention if the patient has asthma or COPD, which would mean significant car, uh, respiratory issues because these medications could worsen that by increasing secretions in the airways. So the next class of medications is the SSRIs, which are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They are antidepressants and increase serotonin in the brain. The prototype that studies were done on uh, um, is Celexa or citalopram. And there is evidence that it can help with both agitation and paranoia in dementia patients with agitation. Um, and again, we'll mention often the problems are secondary to mood disorder, so this would target the mood disorder. Um, and if someone is very agitated, a good approach may be to plan on using an antidepressant and start it. But for the short term, use possibly an antipsychotic until the antidepressant kicks in, since they can take four to eight weeks to really get the full benefit. But they are safer than antipsychotics for the most part. Um, so I'll just mention there was a trial comparing Celexa and Risperdal which is misspelled, um, in dementia patients with agitation. And both of them showed similar efficacy. Once again, we have to worry about that conduction through the heart. There is a warning on Celexa that we have to use a very low dose in people over 60 because this medication could also uh, affect the conduction through the heart, with, which once again could predispose the patient to having abnormal heart rhythm, which is dangerous. Um, so antidepressants, we're going to see a lot of patients on these, so we should definitely um, be aware of side effects. One thing when starting antidepressants, almost all of them, the patient can experience an increase, increase in anxiety and be a bit activated. So it is best to start these medications very low to prevent that from happening and go up slowly. We can see GI distress, particularly with Zoloft or sertraline. Um, appetite can increase or decrease. Headaches are common, particularly with Celexa and Lexapro. Sexual dysfunction is extremely common with most of the antidepressants. 
um, sweating. Uh, if so, with a dementia patient, they may have no idea why they are sweating more, so we should definitely be aware many of the antidepressants can result in sweating. Uh, vivid dreams are extremely common. So these are things that the patient with dementia will not be able to express much of the time, so we need to watch for these. So if someone's dreaming more, or possibly if they have trauma, having complaining of more nightmares, we do need to realize antidepressants may be contributing to this. Um, dry mouth, constipation, um, and another thing with the serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Celexa, they can uh, cause some bleeding difficulties because they can affect the uh, function of the platelets, which have to do with clotting. Um, with all antidepressants, particularly when they're started, there can be an increase in suicidal thinking or behaviors. Um, some specific uh, antidepressants we use and their side effects include venlafaxine or Effexor, um, and uh, we have to watch for hypertension and uh, gastrointestinal uh, complaints. Remeron or mirtazapine we use frequently uh, and take advantage of the side effects of sedation and appetite increase. So for our patients, that's a often a positive side effect. Um, and then we'll touch on bupropion, which is well butrin we need to watch. That can often uh, increase um, anxiety when it's started, uh, can decrease appetite, and can cause an increase in tremor. And duloxetine, which is Cymbalta, can also increase um, uh, blood pressure, like Effexor, and can cause gastrointestinal complaints as well. And trazodone is another antidepressant we frequently use, and we often take advantage of the side effect of sedation to help with sleep. And another important thing is we would like we should watch for orthostasis, which is drop in blood pressure when people stand up with trazodone. So one of the biggest things, which is quite rare but most dangerous with the antidepressants, is serotonin syndrome. And this uh, results from uh, hyperstimulation of the serotonin receptors, and uh, symptoms. The 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 worst symptoms may include seizure, uh, overheating, um, and agitation, and restlessness. And this can be very dangerous. It needs to be treated. And I'll let you review the other symptoms. But it's rare, but something we should be aware of. If someone suddenly seems febrile or their blood pressure is out of whack, their pulse is out of whack, or they seem confused, and they're on antidepressants, we should be aware of this. Um, the anti-epileptic drugs, which we often use for behavioral issues, include carbamazepine, which is Tegretol, Valproate, which is Depakote, Gabapentin, which is Neurontin, and Lamotrigine, which is Lamictal. And uh, Tegretol has been shown to be effective for um, short-term control of agitation in those with uh, dementia. And just to quickly review some of the side effects that we want to be aware of, carbamazepine or Tegretol, we always want to check for the sodium. It can drop the sodium, which uh, can become quite dangerous. It can affect the body's ability to make blood cells, and we also need to monitor the liver uh, fairly frequently with Tegretol. And Valproate, which is Depakote, which we do use frequently, can also affect the liver, so we need to monitor that regularly. Um, can uh, decrease platelets, which we monitor on a regular basis, and uh, some other um, side effects you can review. Um, Lamictal, which is another anti-epileptic. Anti the one thing that we should really all be aware of is the potential for a life-threatening rash. So whoever is starting on Lamictal, which I'm a little wary of in dementia patients because they're not able to report this rash, so if they are started, everyone should watch for the rash. And Neurontin, I would say one uh, side effect to be aware of that people may not is swelling. So swelling is already um, a big issue in these patients and can cause pain in the legs and extremities. So Neurontin could worsen, worsen swelling, so we should all be aware of that potential. And uh, another thing is pain is a major issue in these patients. They can't voice it. There are some studies that show agitation is actually 
decrease when we have a regular protocol to assess pain and are treating it regularly. So I think a big problem in these patients is using PRNs to treat pain. Most of our patients can't even ask for pain medications. Many of them can't even figure out how to press the call light. So a more structured way to assess pain is very important. And you know, I, I just don't think PRNs are the best route, but they are used very frequently. Okay, so antipsychotics, which is sort of the focus here, um, have been shown to be effective, as we mentioned, um, in behavioral difficulties, particularly studies with Risperdal and Zyprexa. Uh, most commonly used are Seroquel, Risperdal, Olanzapine, or Zyprexa, Aripiprazole, which is Abilify, and Clozaril. So I would say those are what we see most being used in the nursing home. And Clozaril um, is used more frequently in those with Parkinson's disease or movement disorders because Clozaril is less likely to exacerbate movement difficulties. And once again, we're going to mention that these are not FDA indicated, and we really don't have anything that is FDA indicated for this treatment. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the warnings on antipsychotics, including the black box warning. So first, in 2003, a warning came out um, specifically with use of Risperdal that there was an increase in stroke, about double the uh, risk of stroke in those using atypicals and specifically Risperdal at that time. Since then, I would say there's conflicting evidence. Um, some studies have found that this, this may not be accurate, but we still always keep this in mind. And then in 2005, um, uh, there was a, a study of 17 trials, and it sort of compiled a lot of data and found that when we use atypical antipsychotics, which are the newer ones, that, like the ones we've mentioned the names of, that patients with dementia-related psychosis have an increased mortality rate, a little less than double the risk. So if one out of 100 would die, those on the atypical antipsychotics, it would be about 1.6 to 1.7 out of 100. Um, and most of these deaths are found to be from cardiac issues and infection. And the actual uh, wording on the black box warning is elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis treated with antipsychotic drugs are at increased risk for death. And this is something we typically like to tell the families, and they should know that there is an increased risk for death when we use these medications. But we also tell them if the patient has psychosis, this is really one of our only, uh, well, our only option to really treat psychosis. Um, and at first, when this warning came out, people thought, oh, maybe we're safer using the old antipsychotics like Haldol, Prolix, and Thorazine because it doesn't have the black box warning, but eventually this warning was extended to all antipsychotics. And then um, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act in 1987 he had a big use on the uh, big impact on the use of antipsychotics in the nursing home, and it called for increased monitoring of antipsychotics in the nursing home. Um, and uh, this uh, act, the federal act, said we must document appropriate diagnosis and target symptoms when we're using antipsychotics. Symptoms change, how they've changed over time, have they uh, changed with this treatment, side effects of the medication, and we need to document that there's a concurrent behavioral plan in place. Other um, items were that there should be one attempt every six months to reduce the medication or a clear rationale for not doing so. And then in January 2007, some new rules came out which even were a little bit more stringent about this gradual dose reduction of antipsychotics. And this stated during the first year after the patient enters the nursing home, even if they were already on the antipsychotic when they came in, there should be two attempts at least a month apart at gradual dosage reduction of the antipsychotic. After the first year of being on the medication, there should be one yearly attempt to reduce the medication. And you can read below um, if we aren't reducing what we should document. 
Okay, so antipsychotic side effects, there's many that we'll try to review quickly. Um, again, this prolongation of the heart, or the heart conduction, the effect of the antipsychotic can be to slow down heart conduction, which we have to be careful, again, because that can result in an abnormal heart rhythm. We'll talk about extrapyramidal symptoms, which are movement issues. We always worry about the metabolic syndrome, which uh, is a combination of increase in weight, waist circumference, um, blood pressure, blood sugar, which can be predisposed to developing diabetes, and we often see an increase in triglycerides and a decrease in HDL. Fatigue, somnolence is a big issue, that which may decrease after the patient gets used to the medication. Stroke, we discussed. And sometimes we can see hyperprolactinemia, which would be almost like lactation, where patients may have milk or swollen breast, either with men or women, and that could uh, increase the, list, the risk of osteopenia or osteoporosis. Um, so another uh, important um, side effect to recognize is orthostatic hypotension with many of these agents. Again, when the patient stands up, their blood pressure drops, and that can increase their risk for falls or injury. Um, we won't touch on this. So extrapyramidal symptoms, which everyone working with these patients should be aware of. Um, one type of uh, extrapyramidal symptom is akathisia, which can result as it, or it can be seen as a physical restlessness, pacing, agitation. So again, we don't want to just assume that this is a primary behavioral disturbance from the disease itself, but this could be a side effect from the medication. Dystonic reactions we need to recognize would be a sudden muscle contraction of the neck, eyes, or other parts of the body, which we do need to treat. Parkinsonism, which, are, which appears to be similar to Parkinson's disease, but is a side effect from the medication with uh, the hallmarks being bradykinesia, which is slowness, rigidity, stiffness, and tremor. So this isn't actually Parkinson's disease, but the side effects from antipsychotics can mimic. Um, cardiac, well, we're running out of time, so we'll try to skip some of the slides. So tardive dyskinesia is a very important side effect, which can result in permanent, abnormal, involuntary movements. It could be uh, grimacing, thrusting the tongue out, rhythmic movements or coriform movements, which are like writhing movements. And it's very important to recognize these early because they can become permanent. A neuroleptic malignant syndrome is another extremely uh, important uh, complication of antipsychotics that can be fatal. And if you see someone who starts on these medications, or it, it could really occur at any time in the treatment and they develop a high fever, rigidity, altered mental status, changes in blood pressure, pulse, we need to really be aware of this condition, which can be deadly. So benzodiazepines, I'm sort of going to skip over and just say I don't use them very much for the treatment of behavioral disturbance. They have quite a few side effects, and I don't feel that they can help in the overall picture. They may be able to help short term for a specific situation, such as getting an MRI or if something really needs to be done urgently and the patient is too agitated, but I don't suggest long-term use. And uh, we'll touch a bit. So falls can be increased with most of our psychotropic medications, particularly antipsychotics. But as you see, the numbers, um, also antidepressants, are correlated with increased risk of falls. Um, fractures are another thing that we're very concerned with in the older population as they become quite common. Um, and so SSRI antidepressants have been re related, associated with lower uh, bone density and increased risk of fracture. Um, and interestingly, lithium can't, may protect against fractures. So we're going to talk about considerations now. One of the main points of this talk is how do we avoid excessive use of antipsychotics. So one thing is when someone calls us and says the patient is having a specific behavior, we really don't want to jump to prescribing medication. We really want to investigate the situation. Pain, we've talked about, is a really major thing we need to investigate. Um, we have to know the patient can't 
um, communicate effectively much of the time, so we need to help um, them with that a great deal. We can't expect them to tell us what's going on and what's leading to their behavior. We always need to look for underlying medical issues, which would co can uh, contribute to delirium, which is an acute confusional state and associated with behavioral difficulties. And uh, that list are um, certain medical issues that could contribute to delirium. And once again, we don't use antipsychotics, we treat the underlying cause. And uh, it's important to be familiar with these patients so you can really suspect what's going on and something's changed. This isn't just part of their dementia. What else is going on that's causing it? So, and new medications, medication side effects we, sort of, we touched on, and let's look at the environment. What's going on that could be causing the agitation? Is there too much noise? Has the routine changed? Are caregivers turning over? Does the patient not have their favorite caregiver anymore? Um, what, are the groups too big? And is the dining room too overwhelming for the patient? Would a smaller group be better? Because we know taking patients into situations with a lot of noise, they can become very overwhelmed. Um, again, so common sense tells us help with their senses, hearing aids, glasses, um, letting the patient have some control. So whatever choices the patient can make themselves uh, would help decrease agitation, um, just giving them that sense of control, making sure they have physical activity, um, and evidence-based approaches that may help are uh, education and support for caregivers, music therapy, which we've touched on, um, the multi-sensory stimulation room, which you were shown before, and of course, staff training and education, and just to point out, um, wandering is uh, one thing where we would avoid antipsychotic use if possible, and things we can do is uh, having a wander garden, locking the doors, um, patterns, visual patterns that can redirect the patient. And this wandering is really a normal behavior. It's not really pathologic. So here is just some ideas for sexually inappropriate behavior. And we'll just finish here with clear indications for medicating, again, uh, behavioral emergencies, when the patient or another is at risk, behavioral approaches have failed, and when the patient, despite what you're doing, continues to appear subjectively distressed and uncomfortable. And that's it. All right, and we have a few minutes for questions. Benadryl. So Benadryl would be something we really try to avoid because we discussed, touched on anticholinergic um, difficulties. Benadryl um, basically blocks a certain chemical, and the result of that can be increase in confusion, falls, so we certainly want to avoid Benadryl in elderly patients, period, but even more so elderly patients with dementia. Other questions? Yes? So right, so end-stage dementia uh, patients are going to develop difficulties just with the mechanism of eating. Appetite is going to decrease. They may not have the sense of smell. So terminal dementia, we would expect the patient to begin to fail um, and lose weight. But so this would be more um, in a patient you would expect to be thriving, and we feel like it's fueled by depression. But then. Uh, end stage terminal dementia, we expect those changes and we would not treat that with an antidepressant. Yes?
Well, I haven't seen a lot of pain development with either Neurontin or Lyrica. So I, I think the thing is, when you look at the side effect list of medications, anything is possible. So I, I would just say, you know, if the pain was suddenly getting worse when you started the medicine, then I would, you know, investigate. But those aren't typical side effects. But that being said, anything can happen from any medication. But of course, like I mentioned, the swelling if from neurons, and if you saw the legs are swelling more and the patient's having more lower extremity pain, then that would be a clear correlation. Okay. Thank you.